One of everybody's favorite things to do this time of year is what? Listen to music, right. Um, in fact, some of us get so um, frustrated with others who put on Christmas carols and music before Thanksgiving that we actually argue about it and complain about it. Um, but it just goes to show that this is the time of year full of lots of music. And my husband actually gets pretty perturbed with me uh, about how much I play the Christmas music, but he's married to me, so he just has to put up with it. <laughs> well, while this is definitely a season of singing, it's also a season of waiting. We've got the third week of Advent. How many of you waited in long lines this past week? How many of you waited over Thanksgiving weekend for a little thermometer to pop out of that turkey? Maybe making your meal a little bit later than what you planned. Have you had to wait in line to get your meal or a drink at a Christmas party? Did you have to wait for guests to arrive to your house? How many of you have waited in, on Tiffin Road uh, in traffic the past couple of weeks? I have. <laughs> How many of you have had your children ask you at least twice already today when Christmas is going to be here? <laughs> the season of Advent is a season of waiting. Sure, it's a season of waiting for little silly things, but it's also awaiting with our hearts in the hearts of everyone for the promises of God to be realized. We wait and we wait for God to be with us. It's 25 days, give or take, that are filled with anticipation, longing, hope, that God will enter the brokenness of our harsh, harsh world. And that's the reason we light a candle each week, that as we get closer to Christmas, it helps us mark our waiting helping us see the light grow stronger and stronger each week against the darkening and ever-expanding nights of December. And today, specifically, we wait with Mary. We find Mary, a poor peasant girl, fleeing to her sister's home in the country, away from the scrutiny of her neighbors and religious judges. Such a tragedy, I'm sure some of them said. She had such potential. Yet despite the embarrassment of what could have put her in hiding for nine months, we find Mary praising God. Praising God with all that she has. I picture Maria. The hills are alive with the sound of music. Right? Mary singing, my soul magnifies the Lord out on some beautiful picturesque mountaintop, spouting about the nature and creation of God, using this Old Testament language, the language of her tradition, to talk about what God has done. And that's has done, not God, what God will do, but what God has done. Here again. Surely, from now on, all, cre all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy according to the promise he has made our ancestors to Abraham and to his descendants forever. Now as I listen again to the things she's saying, it also calls to mind a scene from perhaps the musical Hair <laughs> with psychedelic effects and Mary dancing and jumping around making outrageous claims about who God is and what God has done. But she is a poor, unmarried, pregnant woman singing about the most absurd things that haven't happened and maybe won't if we're on the outside. So why do we continue to sing this song year after year when we read the Gospel of Luke? Because even by the end of the book of Luke, Rome is still in power. And Christianity is still a group of messy, kind of crazy, idealistic, futuristic hopefuls. 
None of the claims that she makes about God scattering the proud, bringing down the powerful, filling the hungry, sending the rich away, rich away empty happen. The wealthy still have power. The poor are still hungry and longing for justice. I guess she did have an angel tell her, and that might be startling enough to actually believe it. But where did she find that faith, the courage, the strength to step back and to allow God to do God's work? And Mary does this knowing the suffering, the indicting glances, the rejection of friends and family, knowing that something sacred is happening. In the midst of her rejection of others and the pain and the embarrassment that came with an unintended pregnancy, Mary experiences the transformation that God offers. It's the transformation that happens when we let go of our expectations of how things are supposed to be and let God use us as God wants. This past week, in one of his uh, daily devotionals that I receive in my inbox, Richard Rohr wrote about this so eloquently. He writes, Whenever we're led out of normalcy into sacred, open space, from normalcy to sacred space, it's going to feel like suffering because it is letting go of what we're used to. This is always painful at some level, but part of us has to die if we are ever going to grow larger. If we're not willing to let go and die to our small, false self, we won't enter into anything new or into sacred space. We dare not get rid of our pain before we have learned what it has to teach us. Most of religion gives answers too quickly dismisses pain too easily and seeks to be distracted, to maintain some ideal order. So we must resist the instant fix and acknowledge ourselves as beginners to be open to true transformation. In the great spiritual traditions, the wounds to our ego are our teachers to be welcomed. They should be paid attention to, not litigated, or even perfectly resolved. Mary is able to move from a hidden, shamed, dishonored girl to a formidable, vocal, and resilient woman. Mary proves to us yet again that this journey of faith is not so much about some uh, belief in God, or about being fed or feeling good or spiritual. But rather, faith is about trusting God's crazy promises to us and allowing the sacred to use us in the midst of undesirable reaction. What happened to Mary, I'm sure, to some in her community, they thought was very tragic. And so it was. The life she thought she had in front of her was gone. Yet Mary, in her strength, wisdom, and with God's help, was able to courageously bear that Christ child. We all have icons of faith, right? That have called us and spoken to us to lead and led us to look beyond what we know, what we expect, assume, or perhaps even see. So that in the waiting time of our lives, like this Advent, becomes sacred space from which God may be known and God's salvific purposes seen. In other words, we're able to acknowledge the wondrous acts of God around us, the splatters of grace mixed in with the brokenness we so readily experience, the misty hue of love that permeates the world around us, despite the obvious suffering and pain that still exists in each of us and in the world around. Advent, this Advent and the Song of Mary remind us of the strength of the story that we have as we wait. Our small song that we sing today with Mary is that we declare a different 
reality. In spite of all the pain and the mess we have made of our world, we declare a world of justice and life and hope and love, not a life of death, of pain, and of struggle. It's the song we sing to profess our faith that we too continue to believe and we trust in a different way of being filled with God's compassion and love. It's a reality that each of us seeks to create, singing as we seek to be that justice and love for the world around. Our waiting for God to be here in and among us isn't easy. There are many, many waiting this year, this day, this Advent season for justice to come, for love to be born, for peace both in hearts and on the streets to prevail. Some wait to hold a child of their own, some wait for food to fill their bellies, some wait for meaning, some wait for a real home, some wait for the war to be over. Some wait with their heads held high like Mary, trusting that God will reveal the road ahead, even if they are unsure of the consequences they will receive from others. Advent, like any other season on their calendar, is not without pain and suffering, if I haven't said that already. It is not some sacred time protected by heartache or protected from heartache and sadness. If anything, as we journey toward Bethlehem, getting closer to that manger, if anything, in the deep parts of our being, we are able to know the paradox that Christ holds, the tragedy and the love that a little child is able to hold together overcoming pain with that love. So may our songs this season acknowledge the hard, broken pieces of our lives and of our world, while with our hearts and our hands we would enter more deeply into the claims of our faith and provide hope, hope to a broken world. May we be able to sing the song of Mary declaring a reality not yet known, but fully promised in the birth of an innocent little child. Amen.